we are live. Welcome to Thoughts Season 1 Luke Cage MCU Show. So, spoilers for the MCU leading up to and including this season. And we are going to dive right into the first episode, Season 1 Episode 1, Moment of Truth. But first I'm going to get yeah. I forgot a couple of things I'm gonna get. Yeah. As a white guy, I realize the N-word is not for me to use. I will not do a black scent. I won't speak in abonics or quote lines that are not for white people to repeat. I won't refer to non-white people by names that they express they don't want used. And yeah, so other Netflix Marvel. Worst to best, keeping in mind I love them all. Daredevil season two, Daredevil season one, Jessica Jones season one. And, yeah, just briefly gonna, yeah, this is the order in which I'll do these shows based on when they premiered on Netflix. And I do, I watch one episode per day most of the time, so on average two weeks between episodes, other than The Defenders, which is only eight episodes. So... The next videos will be Iron Fist Season 1, Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, Luke Cage Season 2, Iron Fist Season 2, Daredevil Season 3, Punisher Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 3. And, yeah, I absolutely love this season. I love all the musical guests. I love the characters, the acting, the cinematography, the editing. Yeah. And... Now, I'm going to start on, yeah, Season 1, Episode 1, Moment of Truth. Now, I've seen some say that uh, that they thought the pilot was just kind of meh. I thought it was good. Great intro, and we open in a black barbershop, a frequent, frequent location for certainly this season of the show. I don't know about Season 2 yet. And it is an important place for many black people. And they're talking about basketball, something many black people are passionate about. And just, I yeah, I really love the the discussions between the, the characters. Uh, you know, basketball, kung fu movies, rap, all, all this stuff that just, yeah. I really love the list of people who get credit at Pops. And Shamik claims Luke does nothing, and Luke asserts how hard he works. Way too many black people are accused of being lazy, not being willing to work. I haven't even passed the bar yet. You will love seeing that kind of support. Now, let's see. I would criticize the male gaze ogling Patty's butt, but it's underlining that she's flirting with Luke, you know, she didn't have to bend over that, you know, yeah, she's doing that to attract his attention, and there's nothing wrong with a woman owning her sexuality. And, yeah, there's the line, I didn't need a daddy then, I don't need one now. Many black men grew up without a father, frequently it's not the father's own choice, but being imprisoned for being black, basically. And, you know, we see this young guy who is now a criminal. It's hard for black people to make an honest living, no matter how many are willing to work hard because of systemic racism. And, yeah, so basically the inciting in incident of the show is the arms deal, you know, th this inside job that the arms deal gets held up, people end up dead, and, yeah, you know, so, so it's tackling... You know, crime in black communities, again, not because they're bad people, but, yeah, it's it's difficult to, to make it when, you know, yeah, due to systemic racism. It's dealing with guns in these neighborhoods. It's, let's see, and, yeah, and, and this, you know, the criminal investigation is what what's the word, you know, for example, that's how it 
it comes it comes out that Scarf is a dirty cop. And it's how Knight starts working towards, you know, taking down some of the, yeah, you know, building cases against the, uh, the organized crime. And the show brings up aging, an issue for many women in the West and Stokes off offers Luke a job where he'd carry a gun. Luke turns him down. He doesn't want violence in his life. And another woman who doesn't drink coffee. Eh, very risque sex scene, but it tells us where the people are. It's not their fertilization. And that claims afterwards that she's an auditor because that is less <laughs> Yeah, you know, we see after that she's a cop. And some black people consider cops to be their worst enemy, which a lot of the way is true. And those think that black people who become cops are basically traitors. And, you know, basically she became a cop because she thinks that she can help people like that. And we see Luke still has nightmares about Seagate. I know I'm far from the first person to say it, but man, Mahershala Ali can act. And Pops explains the problems for black youth, black youth, how he tries to help. And Luke chimes in with, everyone has a gun, no one has a father. And Luke claims that he hadn't seen any of the people involved. He doesn't want to get involved. And this is, again, you know, like, he saw, you know, he, he could tell they're going to do something bad, you know. And, yeah, he doesn't stop them because he legitimately feels, you know, in, in part, it's because he's scared that, you know, the him, what's the word? Yeah, him him having been at Seagate and not being released, but escaping, he doesn't want that to come out. And let's see. Yeah, and, you know, after getting up in personal with some of the kids, Mariah gets some hand sanitizer. She doesn't believe the message that she's spreading. It's just a political tool. And you also see the look on her face really, you know, yeah. And, you know, once the kids can't see her face, it becomes much harsher. And Cornell stands in front of the poster of Biggie Smalls. From the camera's point of view, he's the one wearing the crown. And I think it is significant that of all the powerful black men, Cornell chooses the notorious B.I.G. Now, I'm going to quote, quote some Wikipedia for context. So, yeah, he was rooted in East Coast, which, you know, for people who aren't aware, East Coast is New York, so... You know, yeah, the, New York is what Cornell is trying to run. Yeah, rooted in the East Coast hip-hop, particularly gangster rap, he's widely considered one of the greatest rappers of all time. Wallace became known, real name Wallace, became known for his distinctive laid-back lyrical delivery, offsetting the lyrics' often grim content. His music was often semi-autobiographical, telling of hardship and criminality, but also of debauchery and celebration, and yeah, you know, Sto uh, Cornell wants to convey with that picture, you know, I, t yeah, the, the hardship and criminality, but also debauchery and celebration. During 1996, while recording his second album, Wallace became ensnarled in the 
escalating East Coast West Coast hip hop feud following Tupac Shakur's death in the drive-by shooting in Las Vegas in September 1996. Speculations of involvement in Shakur's murder by criminal elements orbiting the Bad Boy Circle circulated as a result of Walls' public feud with Shakur. On March 9th, 1997, six months after Shakur's death, Wallace was murdered by an unidentified assailant in a drive-by shooting while visiting Los Angeles. So, Cornell is comfortable with the idea of feuding with other powerful black people. He didn't put up a poster of prominent powerful black man Nelson Mandela, characterized by his mercy, his ability to forgive his enemies, even after being wrongfully imprisoned for decades by them, because that's not how Cornell wants to conduct himself. He did not put up a poster of Malcolm X, who is in part known for accepting... Ah, uh, hold on. I can't believe I made it. I swear I, I don't think all black people look alike. Obviously... That was not Malcolm X. I was thinking of Muhammad Ali. It's because I'm not into sports. You know, I don't really know the names of the... Yeah, Muhammad Ali, the, the boxer, who is in part known for accepting the law punishing him for refusing military service that he thought was ethically wrong, I get the feeling that Cornell in that situation would try to use force instead. The poster isn't of Dr. Martin Luther King, who wanted to use protest to make things better for all black people, you know, Cornell, you know, he, yeah, Cornell Stokes shares the first name with Cornell West, a man also trying to improve conditions for all black people, because Cornell Stokes wants the power for himself, not to empower all black people. He could work to do that, and he chooses not to, and that's part of what makes him a villain, and very notably a villain on a show that is all about black people, you know, and, and that is, the I, I wasn't sure before I started watching if the villain was going to be white or black, and there are some white, you know, not, not top tier villains, but like, yeah, you know, there's um, Rackham, I want to say his name is, of, of Seagate, you know, so there, there are powerful white people making black people miserable, but yeah, a number of black people do feel that by far the people who do the most harm to black people are powerful black people who don't try to improve, you know, the situation. I mean, they say at one point that if he sold the club, what was it like, I forget the exact number, but I'm certain they said something about million so you know at least a million he could improve he could improve the lives of so many black people in Harlem but he doesn't want to he want you know the the club which is the debauchery and celebration side and you know it's not really a secret that he's you know he's running guns he's got all this you know it's an open secret that he's this this gun runner so yeah, you know, he really identifies with Biggie Smalls, and the idea that someone else might try to kill him for, you know, his power doesn't bother him because he's sure he'll win. And... Yeah, so the episode ends with Luke saving the restaurant owner and his wife, showing what he can do, and he says that he's not for hire, but, you know, the comic is called Luke Cage Hero for Hire. So, yeah, you know, yeah, even by the end of this season, he's not really for hire, but he does go around doing heroic things. So I'm guessing either Defenders or Season 2 of the show will, you know, similar to how, you know... Matt Murdock's alias was called Black Mask until, what was it the finale? It, it was late season one, certainly, that he started going by the Daredevil of Hell's Kitchen. I really appreciate that Luke himself makes it clear he hates the N-word. And, let's see. Yeah, so the, the strip club employs male gaze 
I'm not, I, I guess the point is, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, men lower their guard at strip clubs. That is how I'm going to go ahead and plead the fifth and say I do not recall his name. And it's not, it's not a race thing. I am really bad with names sometimes. So, but yeah, the guy who gets caught got caught there. You know, he wasn't... Yeah, he, he wasn't careful enough. He didn't... Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. So, that brings us to the second episode. Code of the Streets. Great sequence of night piecing together how the arms deal went wrong. I, I really love how they do that with, with her character. And Luke uses code to ask Pops if he should take out Cornell and the others, the other two. And let's yeah, and and Tone fires SMGs into the barber shop, killing Pops. And you know Luke tries to avoid his power being revealed. And, you know, at, at first, Cornell, you know, Cornell is unhappy when he's told, you know, the, the, that Tone fired into the barbershop. You know, Cornell says, Pops can rebuild. I will donate some money to him anonymously. You know, because obviously if he knew where the money was coming from, he'd give it back. He wouldn't take the money. But then Tone says, you know, I I fired into the shop while Pops was in there. Pops is dead, you know. And, yeah, Cornell is furious and throws him off the roof. I really appreciate that, you know, we do see that he did. Cornell does have, you know, he does still care about Pops. He, do, he did not want anything to happen to him. And Turk goes back to hell, back to Hell's Kitchen, where it's safe. Was this written before they knew that Daredevil season two would have the Hell's Kitchen overrun by hand ninjas, or is that supposed to be the joke? That obviously, that's uh, yeah. And Luke freaks out the kid with the gun, hopefully getting him to put down the gun, pick up a book like Luke did. That's also something I really appreciate. It's very clear from this season that part of why Luke does the right thing is that he has been empowered by knowledge. Knowledge about, you know, black history. It's not as simple as saying, you know, I... I'm not saying the following is going to sound like I am criticizing. I'm saying something that worked extremely well in the first Captain America movie was he doesn't want to kill anyone. He doesn't like bullies. He doesn't care where they're from. I don't think that would have worked for this show. It's more complicated than that, you know, and yeah. It, it is extremely important that, you know, that's part of why a lot of white politicians work so hard to avoid black people learning about their history in school. You know, I, I forget the exact, there, there was some, um, was it maybe a protest or something, I, I forget exactly, but there was some, like, significant event in, in you know, the, the history of black people in America and there, there's this um, there's this person who said we didn't learn about that in school. They learned from watching the Watchmen show, you know, because that how sad is that that you have to learn. For, I'm I've heard that the show is good. I'm not saying it's a bad show, but fiction should not be where we learn things like that, you know, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if the the people who wrote that episode were, you know, maybe back when they went to, to school, 
you know, there were still, you know, more parts of black history were being taught, or if they learned after school. And in this episode, we realized Pops could have gone down the same road as Cornell. It really is about making the choice to be a force for positive change rather than a source of violence. And for choosing good, he ends up dead. You know, he even employs a swear jar to encourage good behavior. You know, the the you know, it's it's basically the idea that that's where it starts. If you don't and and it is also like the language that we use is extremely important. You know, that that's part of why, you know, a lot of conservatives try to make the term trigger into a joke because they don't want people taking seriously you know mental and, and it's ridiculous because no one is triggered more than conservatives in the West that's like nothing it takes nothing to set them off but they don't want people talking about the psychological emotional harm done to minorities you know words do matter that brings us to the third episode, Who's Gonna Take the Weight? And by the way, all of these episode titles are, you know, they're, they're, they got the names from, I want to say it was Gangstar. And I did not write that in here. Did I write it in here? I am not going to spend forever investigating the matter, but I'm pretty sure Huh. I... Okay, but I believe it is Gangstar. Yeah, I, you know, to, to further expand on my point, I love that this is a show where the black adults know and appreciate black history the good try to use that for good, while those who choose evil use it for selfish purposes. And a number of the young people don't know these things, and they sometimes make bad choices because of it. You know, Cornell and Mariah do understand black history. They're just not interested in using it for good. They, they use it, yeah, to, to empower themselves, not the... And let's see. Yeah, and Cornell and Luke disagree on Pop's burial. And even knowing that it was against Cornell's orders and that Cornell killed the guy for it, he still blames Cornell for Pop's death. And ultimately, that does make. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have happened. And yeah, a strong theme in this is who is willing to step up and take the risk, which risk, which is very important for black people in America. Very cool when Luke goes for the money, both times, both places. And the camera doesn't cut. There's even the part where without a cut, it goes from him going for the money to Knight talking to the strung out girl. I love the editing on the show, especially when it toys with time and place. It employs uh, Christopher Nolan's smooth editing between past and present, also seen in the excellent movie Martha Marcy May Marlene. And... Let's see. Yeah. Right, and yeah, when, when Cornell tries to insult Luke, he always goes for money and power. He doesn't talk about what's ethically right. You know, but he, like, he says, you're fired. And he says, wow, you have a lot of guts for a dishwasher. You know, he, he never says, what I'm doing is the ethically right. You know, he, he appeals, which is, again, you know, he his appeals are not like those of Dr. King. Um, I can't believe I'm already blanking on the name. Cornell West, Nelson Mandela. 
you know, he... Yeah, and, and to be clear, as far as I understand, the, um, you know, Notorious B.I.G., he did not... There's no clear evidence that he himself killed anyone or gave an order that got people killed. So it's it's not it's not a, a you know a one to one. They're not the exact same. But yeah, you know, if you listen to some of Biggie's music, he is talking about you know I am superior. I am the the better. Which you know that is a a significant portion of gangster rap. I've listened to quite my share is, you know, trying to prove that you are better, which, you know, when you have nothing, that is basically what you, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of the most prominent gangster rappers started out with nothing. They weren't born into wealth. You know, they had to work their way up, and as such, it's a lot about the, the strength and such. Luke and Scarf both shame Knight for having sex with Luke, but she doesn't really... As far as I can tell, she doesn't think that there was anything wrong with it, and really, there, there wasn't. Now... I acknowledge that, obviously, in the real world, as, as a police officer, there are certain rules and such, but those rules are really messed up. Like, it's it's ridiculous to... Yeah. And Domingo drops candy bars and wrappers on the club floor just to show that he's more powerful than Cornell, and Cornell looks at it. No, really, there is a Mark Bar down there. Great metaphor, Domingo. That is, yeah. I've seen critics say too much of the show is Luke not getting involved. I really have no idea what they mean. Even this early in the show, he gets involved. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. If, if you can explain to me, please put it in the comments. I'm, I'm willing to hear you out. I, I just, I don't know. And... It's so annoying when people do reviews and they don't leave examples of it, it. You know, I just I saw multiple reviews that just independently of each other said too much of the show is Luke not getting involved, or too much of the season is Luke not getting involved. I love when Luke grabs a car door and later a steel pipe and attacks and opens the door to the money so that the cops can get it. And. Yeah, overall, the, the action in this show is better than Jessica Jones Season 1. That wasn't trying to be an action show, though, that. So, yeah. And... Yeah, you know, Luke's hoodie is like Trayvon Martin, so they are underlining that you can look like that and be a hero, and... Let's be clear, Trayvon Martin did nothing wrong. You know, Zimmerman's a psychopath. And that brings us to the fourth episode of the season, Step in the Arena. And, yeah, we get a prison flashback to see how bad things are there, and... Carl punches the wall, bruising his knuckles, showing us this is before he got his powers. And Squabbles underlines what Reva said. I appreciate the show challenges the harmful stereotype that men should not reach out, should suffer alone. If they're tough, they'll be fine. And... Yeah, Rackham offers gladiator matches, and... Luke, you know, points out it's just, it's another form of slavery. Very realistic uh, depiction of prison corruption. It's really gross when Rackham frames squabbles. I really appreciate when, you know, Luke says he'll, the only way he'll fight is with squabbles by his side. 
Good talks between Reva and the Khans, especially Luke. And I appreciate that the fighting doesn't go perfect from right away. And we see the origin of how he got his powers. How Reva got the yellow USB key. And let's see. Yeah, you know, both Shades and Rackham believed that Luke was dead after the last time they saw him, which makes a lot of sense. Like, what Shades, you know, as bad as Shades beat Luke, like, it very little, it, you know, if they didn't do something to, to save his life, if nobody did something to save his life, he would have died, and I can imagine that's probably what Rackham told Shades and the other guy, you know. And, yeah, Rackham, uh, what's the word? He disabled the, the machine. So, yeah, he thought that Luke was not going to be saved. And that brings us to episode 5, Just to Get a Rep. A montage getting us up to date on where the various characters are. Cornell looks like he won't give up. Luke cleans up the debris in front of people now that the public knows his name and powers. Claire arrives in Harlem. I really love, you know, like, a guy tries to rob her and she's like, no. And just runs after, you know, catches up to him and, like, beats him to just, yeah, that that was awesome. You know, that's that's real, like... Okay, so I guess she's second generation, but they do say that she's Cuban. Her mother was Cuban and still sometimes speaks Spanish, too. So, so yeah, it's like maybe second generation, but that is some real immigrant energy right there. Like, no, you are not going to take from me what I have. That is not a thing that's going to happen here. And obviously, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying all immigrants can do that, but just... Yeah, that is definitely a, you can you can tell this was not made by like white people who only know stereotypes. No, this was like yeah. I don't know if it always necessarily looks like that, but there are a number of immigrants, maybe especially in New York, who refuse to accept if other people try to take from them. And let's see. Yeah, so you know, Cornell shoots the guy who suggests that they let Luke have his side of the streets. And again, you know, he he read a book, so he you know, he knows some of yeah. And, you know, tells them to tighten the screws and to blame Luke, and you know, Luke manages to you know, it, it does have some effect at first, but Luke does manage to turn it around. The service for Pops is a great scene. Aisha wants to shoot Cornell. Luke knows that would only make things worse, so he folds the gun, and both Cornell and Luke give strong speeches. You know, Cornell in part, like, he, he points out, well, you know, Pop used to be, you know, he used to be really violent. And then Luke goes up and says, it's, you know, it's what we choose to, to, yeah. Really loved that. And that brings us to episode six, Suckers Need Bodyguards. And let's see. Yeah, great to see a, you know, cameo from... Not Jessica Jones herself, but the show Jessica Jones with Trish talk. And she points out that the only people who dislike Cage are the ones who don't know him personally. I can really understand why her show is so popular. And that's, again, a great... I, I forget where, but I somewhere online I saw... It might have been a YouTube comment. Someone made the point that the people who really hate you know, minority groups a lot of them have never met or at least not gotten to know a member of that minority you know and that's why you know you'll you'll see like these ridiculous like there was that there was that Karen 
I get okay. So that this was a while ago. I don't know, maybe a year ago or more. There was a Karen who called the cops on this black man, who literally just like I, th I think he asked her to put a leash on her dog, and she calls the cops and she's like crying and claiming that he's like threatening to kill her. And I, I remember, you know, Young Turks talked about, you know, she's really taking advantage of her privilege as a white person, you know, knowing that she's going to be, be believed over him, which is also why it was really smart of him to, to film the whole thing. Honestly, and I'm not making any excuses here, but I, I think, I think a lot of white Americans, when they see a black person, like, they don't see a fellow human being, they just immediately all these things pop into their heads from movies from ads from music all all these different images of black people being violent like a lot of white people the only thing they know about black culture is gangster rap which is just ridiculous you know like i said i've listened to a lot i'm I've never believed that it was the only kind of, of black culture, you know, so, but, but yeah, you know, if you live in a conservative bubble, that's all you see, and, and that's a real problem, that's really something that's going to take some effort to deal with, and that's something I really appreciate, like, this show doesn't, like, that's, it's, it would be a really easy mark for this show to say, oh, look at these white people who've never met a black person. I don't think there's a single white person on this show who, like, has never encountered a black person before and just freaks out at there being a black person. You know, so, because, yeah, that's... that It's a huge problem, but it's not the... It's almost it's almost too obvious of a problem for the show to to tackle when really yeah you know a, a lot of people don't think about powerful black people who abuse their power and Mariah verbally expresses her sexuality to Luke I love how confident about their sexuality the major female characters on the show are and how it's never punished I guess, ah, did Knight, I guess she got in trouble for it, but ultimately I'm not sure that, like, she didn't, like, um, yeah, you know, her having a personal relationship with him before she found out that, you know, there were these things that's actually part of why she trusts him and is willing to hear him out. And let's see. Yeah, Claire and Luke meet back up. She points out that after saving someone's life, it's very natural to focus on them, want to make sure they're safe. That's a, you know, documented psychological phenomenon. And Claire helps Scarf, who says he can take down Cornell because of all he knows about his crimes. Similar to mid-level mob, mob bosses. And Knight explains Scarf's son Earl died because of the one night where he forgot to lock up his gun. This is a very common issue. Guns stored in the home frequently lead to shooting someone you didn't mean to. No. Uh, you know, Claire's mom lends them the van and threatens Luke if her daughter gets hurt. And that's, again, very immigrant energy there. That is, yeah. You know, I, th I think she says something like, the van is one thing, but if you hurt my daughter, it's, yeah. I was kind of surprised, like, the... Okay, so I think the pronunciation is them be... Is it Tembi? Uh, yeah, I think they say Tembi in the show. You know, she she says, call us using the number at the bottom of your screen. I really thought that that was going to be like, oh, you know, someone called and had, like, 
some really, yeah, said something really provocative that got, yeah. But I can imagine that Tembi wanted that to be the outcome. And Cornell, uh, uh, Cornell's people follow Luke in the van, very cool action scene. And, you know, since Luke himself is bulletproof, the show has to come up with other things for us to worry happen. And it does a really great job at it this season. I, yeah, you know, it, it would be boring if just every other scene was him going into important places. You know, we, we do have a little bit of that. Um, was it episode three or something where, you know, he'll, he'll go in and he'll leave the money, you know, there so that the cops will, you know, they have to take it, you know, not, not take it under the table kind of thing, but it's, you know, I forget, is it evidence or is it, I, I forget exactly what the, but, but yeah, you know, and how's, Gor how's Cornell going to get the money back without someone knows, you know, so yeah. But instead, it's these thing of these things of he doesn't want you know there, there are people he cares about that could get hurt. Let's see. And the interview gets confrontational, but Mariah does regain control. But then they try to get a comment out of her for the arrest of Cornell. I love how Knight handles the other corrupt cop, like faking a call from Scarf and then recording what he said in response. Just, yeah. You know, if he wasn't a dirty cop, then he'd be like confused. As, what? That doesn't make any sense, you know. But no, he he is a dirty cop. He was working with Scarf, and just, yeah, just beautiful. And. Yeah, the, the what the flick people, uh, you know, say, why did Mariah agree to a live interview? Of course, it's going to get gotcha. And why does she keep photographs around the house? No one does that anymore. They use devices. I mean, I think it's this thing of like, I mean, if you agree to do a live interview, you are, I, I mean, you might as well like put on a, a hat where, you know, up across your forehead it says I have nothing to hide you know because yeah the moment that it's live it literally like if if the interviewer mentions one thing that you can't give a satisfying answer to you know I guess you did have something to hide now and and the you know photographs like yeah I I think I mean what one of the people in the photographs is Mama Mabel, and it is the thing of, you know, does she want to be like Mama Mabel? You know, and, and it is that thing, like, if what, what if your parents did awful things? You know, they're still your parents, like, obviously, for some people, it does end up with a lot, you know, with, with outright hatred, but, you know, a lot of a lot of us love our parents and what if you know what about the things they do wrong how do you how do you cope with that and yeah you know Cornell became what Mama Mabel wanted and Mariah refused to be a an, an open criminal but by the end of the season you know she's what's the, the she's she, um, she's calling for for you know, murder of, you know, that she, she got Candace killed, you know, so she is, yeah, she became what, see, I forget if Mama Mabel was her mother, I'm gonna go with, you know, she became what Mama Mabel wanted from, you know, her offspring in general, and that is, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, you're, you're, Parents teach you a lot, and it, it's difficult to get back away from that. So I, I think it makes sense for the character. You know, I, I get that obviously they also, they wanted to have so that, you know, they could film this picture and, and have it as B-roll and say, why, are you, why do you have a picture of Mama Mabel when we all know that she was this criminal, you know, I get that that's part of it, but I do think that it makes sense for the character. 
And that brings us to episode 7, Manifest. As we start the episode, love Luke casually walking up and the guys dropping their guns and running out. Just, you know, he doesn't even have to, he doesn't have to run, he doesn't have to, like, shout for attention. You know, they, you know, they hear, okay, someone's walking up and they turn as, oh, no. <laughs> and Turk is like, come on, man. And Luke asks Claire if she wants him to be like Daredevil, beating people up. And again, I, I really appreciate because that is like, these are different approaches. You know, Daredevil is trying to scare people, you know, he's beating up the specific criminals so that they won't be able to do the thing again. But it's also like, you know, if you're, if, if what you hear about criminals is that they're successful, you know, it's more likely, you know, if, if you are in the, in the living under conditions that breed, you know, that, that can lead to more crime, you might end up being, becoming a criminal. But if, like, a lot of the time when you hear about criminals, it's like, oh yeah, another criminal got put in the hospital. You know, you're like, maybe no, how about, how about that? You know, Luke himself is trying to be a good example. He's saying you know, to to all the young black people, I was young once too. I get it. But you have to be better. You have to, you know, so yeah. What did he say? Enough. Like Thor, Luke gets to enough fast. Very compelling flashback the first time we see Cornell kill someone. Or, uh, yeah, we see the first time he kills someone. Not quite same. And Cornell knows Luke's past, threatens to put him in prison, and Luke considers running again. And we get this great flashback where Mama Mabel expresses empathy for trans sex workers, even slapping Cornell when he says the trans person should fight like a man. You know, as, as far as I can tell, this, um, this particular trans person was um, biologically male, but identified female. And, you know, the, the mama, Mabel, says to the, the trans worker, you know, they can't hit their wives, so they hit you instead. Or, yeah, it was, it was something like that, you know. And, yeah, you know, it's... And, and even if, like, that's one of the things about transphobia, a number of trans people are forced into sex work because they are kicked out of the house when they're, you know, underage and, and they can't, they don't have anywhere to go. So they, you know, they become, yeah, they are unhoused and sex work is something that, you know, some of them can do to, to survive, you know, and then a lot of the people who find themselves sexually attracted to trans people because of transphobia, they feel shame and they take that out on the trans people. And, you know, I like the, the DVD seller wants to film Luke doing his thing and share the money they make off it. Film it in 4K, even. And he's there in the finale filming the fight. And Luke threatens Domingo, talking him through, dropping him into the Hudson, and he gets his new hoodie. I, I really love that. was, And he's like, see, the thing is, it's not the drop that kills you. It's the impact, you know, and he's, and all the way down, you're going to be thinking, why didn't I, what, what was it, why didn't I just agree to what Luke said, or something like that, you know. Let's see. Yeah, so the fact that Knight had sex with Luke and he's now a person of interest, possibly a suspect, causes some problems for her, but, and I love this, it's not made out that she's easy. She's someone who has sex with just anyone. She's being treated the same as if she were a man who had sex with a person of interest, which happens in a bunch of stories, like, you know, off the top of my head, basic instinct. They're never really judged for, you know, yeah, for that, 
decision, you know, the stereotype goes that men always want sex, but that women should stay pure. Let's see. You know, there, there are a lot of, of straight men who have made, like, stand-up comedy jokes, for example, where they talk about, ah, women really don't want sex very often, and it's like, you realize that you're, you're basically telling the world, I'm terrible at, you know, no woman wants sex from me. No, you know, I, I can't, you know, charm or flirt. It's, you know, the so, yeah, that, you know, if, if you look at it without cultural context, women have the same drive toward, or is it slightly less? It's, it's not a huge you know, there's not a huge difference as as far as, it's it's been a while since I looked at, but there's been studies, you know. The thing is that culturally, we say that women shouldn't have more sex. And, you know, basically what it originated as was men being insecure that even if, like, even if they marry the woman, she might cheat on him and they just can't handle that. And instead of, you know, trying to treat the whim, the woman so well that she doesn't want to cheat. T to be fair, it's not, I'm not saying that it's your fault if someone cheats on you, but just, I think it's really disgusting to claim that they shouldn't even want sex to begin with, when that just isn't the case. Now, let's see. Yeah, we see a flashback. Mariah wanted Pete dead more than Cornell, but Cornell has to pull the trigger. And, yeah, so I'm about to use the term triggered unironically. Mariah and Stokes, uh, Cornell, discuss their past, reputations, who had it worse. And when Cornell claims that she wasn't molested, but wanted it, it triggers her anxiety, and she ends up beating him to death. And... You know, while it doesn't necessarily lead to violence, being triggered is a common reaction to being victim blamed for sexual assault and rape. Very psychologically accurate. And the show makes it clear that Sto that Cornell is in the wrong here. Considering all the unusual places this, sh this season goes, I find it a little frustrating that it does have an internal affairs investigation with the show playing it like, oh, they're awful, they're just, they just make things worse. Excellent episode ending. Luke shot with at least one of the Judas bullets by Hammer Industries. And we're not sure if he's going to survive. And that brings us to the eighth episode, Blown Up the Spot. I have to wonder, the thing with the Judas bullets, like, is that based on the... Um, the bunker buster that he sold that that he that he made part of the um, you know he called it the ex-wife and he made it part of which is also just such a gross stereotype yeah he he uh, you know it, it's a lot of the time it's just that men can't handle that women have any power so yeah let's make a huge joke out of like before divorce, you know, women had to stay their whole lives with a man who might even cheat on them and be really abusive. Anyway, yeah, the, to get back to what I was, you know, the bunker buster he made was also supposed to, like, go inside and explode, but these bullets actually do work, although I've seen someone make the point that Rhodey should have known better because it's a bunker buster, meaning that if it hits something, it's not going to explode because it you know, it has to go inside of the, the bunker. So, yeah, anyway. So, in addition to shooting him last episode, the shooter also follows the, the car to confirm the kill. Considering how many oddly incompetent professional killers are in film fiction, I always appreciate seeing ones that are smart. He even shoots the car, knocking it over. And references the warriors. Right, and this is, this is Stryker, isn't it? And Shade says, the secret to living a great life is it has to run parallel to a lie. And that is, that is true of, you know, a lot of, 
organized crime, you know, if when you really get up the ranks, you know, yeah, the they they are able to make a lot of money and wield a lot of power, but part of it does mean that they have to pretend, you know, like, I mean, Al Capone, everyone knew he was doing it, but they couldn't prove that he was behind all this moonshine. And they ended up getting him on unpaid taxes because it was like, well, he's spending a lot of money. Has he filed taxes? You know, and it's, it actually, it's like, it's a, it's a running gag. It's a running joke in The Untouchables. Can we look at his tax? Ah, don't, don't be ridiculous. That's, uh, that's never going to work, you know. So, so yeah, uh, the, yeah, that is, I really like the intercutting of cleaning up to make it seem like Mariah didn't kill Corona, and then Knight and the others investigating. It is a tad contrived that Knight knows that Candace wasn't comfortable going to Cornell alone because she happened to be present when Candace asked Luke to go with, and she has other evidence. They didn't have to have this convenience. You know, so far, that's something I want to make clear. That's not unique to the show. This is, so let's see, this is the fourth season of a... Am I right about that, or am I... Let's see. Yeah, this is the fourth season. I've seen two seasons of Daredevil, one season of Jessica Jones. All four of these have some contrived writing, convenient writing. And we see Stryker express jealousy of Luke. And let's see. Yeah, and, and Stryker threatens Knight and tries to get her to beg or cry or something. And then the finale, she's like, she, she yeah, he said something like, you're not going to beg, not even a little bit. And she stands over him and is like, you're not going to try to move, not even a little bit. And, you know, the, the uh, EMT right next to her is like, what's your problem, you know? But to be fair, I mean, he knows that this is someone who tried to kill Luke Cage, who many consider to be a hero. Like, even if this guy doesn't think that Luke Cage is a hero, presumably he wants him to, like, have a trial, not just be murdered in the street by someone, you know, yeah. Let's see. So, yeah, I don't love that this is an entire episode of Luke recovering from being shot once, and then it ends with him being shot again, you know. So it is basically a filler episode, as we also saw in Jessica Jones Season 1 and Daredevil Season 2. I'm not sure. I don't think there was any filler in, in Daredevil Season 1, but, yeah. that I think that's the only one that's completely avoided it. And, yeah, in this episode, Luke is believed to have murdered someone and be dangerous. A very scary situation for any black man. And, again, one that many of them suffer completely unfairly. In, you know, they're innocent. And that brings us to episode 9. <laughs> D-W-Y-C-K. Is it? Wick? I haven't heard the, the song itself. I do like Gangstar. I might check out. The, yeah. <clears throat> and at first it seems like the psychologist is yet another negative depiction, but he does try to relate tonight, but also push pretty hard. And I appreciate that Let's see, does it ultimately reveal that she was wrong, she wasn't being recorded, or... I remember that the, the other cop was in there watching, but I forget if it was recording. <clears throat> and alone with Cornell's body, Mariah talks about having to raise him, how she wasn't ready for that. A lot of African Americans are raised by family members since their real fathers are in prison. Not all of them are ready for it when it happens. And sadly, very realistic negative reaction by cops to Luke. They treat him like he's guilty before they even identify him. Very cathartic to see him escape. 
and he even blocks the cop with his body when his partner shoots. I really love Knight calling out the sexist double standard for the cops. What's up, Doc? I always wanted to say that. Yeah, Claire is right. You are corny. And the doctor mentions the X Factor X gene. And Mariah says to handle Luke and the other supers with his weapons. Big Pharma. Great reference. It is wild that it's legal to do what they do. And holy crap, that is extremely painful for him, what they do to help Luke. So, the What the Flick People said that Stryker is a boring villain right out of Saturday Morning Cartoon. Cornell was better, very human. I think overall the season might have been better if Cornell had been the villain all the way through. And I'm not sure I'm really unhappy about anything they do with Domingo, but if Stryker maybe had been like the right hand, like the... Okay, nothing I need to deal with right now. Yeah, I know. I used to put my phone on silent, but I haven't been able to find a way to both put it on silent and have it report thunder in my general area. So I decided that, yeah, because thunder. Now, the, the, what was the thing that, um, it, yeah, yeah. If Stryker was basically the guy who went out, and you're going you're gonna to have some conflict between Stokes, uh, between Cornell and Stryker. Maybe, you know, Cornell thinks that Stryker goes too far or something. And yeah, maybe, yeah, like, the, the, if the, yeah, see, ultimately, I think I would have liked the big fight in the finale better, which I do like. It's great. I think if it was someone that we had seen more interactions and where there was a clear... I think if Cornell had been the one instead of Stryker, I think that would have been more interesting. You know, basically, if it were Cornell, the two of them would be fighting over... Pop's soul, along with Harlem's soul. As it is, they're fighting over the love of their father, which we... Do we even see... I don't think there's a single flashback to him. We're only told... Oh, wait, yeah, there was, there was that one where Luke sees and he... Yeah, we barely know, you know, his, his father. And... Pops is such a big part of, you know, and, and Cornell is always telling people, you know, Pops used to be criminals, you know, he's basically trying to rationalize this, yeah. And that brings us to the 10th episode, Take It Personal. Clever, if painful, way for Claire to restart Luke's heart. And Stryker points out abolition led to guns rights. And Stryker pretends to be Luke killing a cop, which is, you know, again, it's such, it's a clever, you know, that's the thing that really, you know, that becomes a big problem for Luke, is that people mistakenly believe that he's dangerous. Again, something many young black people have to deal with and it you know it makes their lives so much more dangerous Let's see. and and Luke realizes we've lied to him like many black men in America is lied to by many including people he trusts Let's see. and Lonnie's mother, the lawyer, points out many black cops are just as bad for black civilians as white cops. And, yeah, it's it's confirmed that Stryker really is Luke's half-brother. A lot of people have affairs and won't acknowledge the offspring. And Mariah goes to the press and, you know, at the, at the protest... She turns it from the cops hurt Lonnie to 
the cops need Judas bullets so smoothly. Great politician, and that's not a compliment. Very cool ending. Very, you know, I I was very excited to see what they were gonna do after, and that takes us to episode eleven, entitled "Now You're Mine." I love how Claire gradually gets to where Luke is, talking to Candace, getting escorted to the basement, tapping the wall to find a hollow spot. With that said, it was convenient that the one person hurt is 100% on her side and knows where, knows where there's a secret door to get to where Luke is. At least she didn't find the door. Luke made a new one for her. And that then, you know, Shades realizes that Luke must be down there, you know, but... And, and Candace, you know pass out, you know, and she just does just like that, and, you know, yeah, it's it's clever, like, the, yeah, but, you know, yeah, in the, in the room, there are lots of people who don't realize that Luke is innocent, so the one person that was shot, and that, you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. <clears throat> I appreciate the various conversations about tactics in this episode. And Stryker talking to Boone about jealousy of their father, loving Luke more does help to humanize him. I didn't know I wanted a Die Hard episode of Luke Cage, but I absolutely loved it. The only thing missing would be explosives. Love seeing Knight and Claire tag team shades. Like, you know, neither of them are quite. Like, Claire doesn't know. Um, she hasn't been trained enough in fighting. You know, she takes a self-defense course. She she you know sees the the posting for one and takes one of the little things that you can call, and uh, what's it called? Yeah, she she does that at the at the very end of the finale. But yeah, at this point, she doesn't quite have enough. To, yeah, actually, that might have been one of the things that made her decide to do that. Yeah, so. The, the, you know, and Knight is too wounded to take him on her own, so they kind of have to tag, and just, yeah, so much fun. And Luke saves Candace, but gets caught by the cops, and Willis gets away. And that brings us to the second-to-last episode... Soliloquy of Chaos, episode 12. And... Oh, there we go. And Knight speaks in code to Luke. Absolutely love it. You know, like, the other cops think she's just, like, reprimanding the suspect, telling him, you better not cause trouble. You're going to get in a lot of, you know, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you don't, you know. But really what she's saying is, if you don't cause any problems on the way to the station, I will make sure that nobody hurts you on the, you know, you're, you're, things are going to get a lot worse for you if you don't agree to go to the station. You know? At first I really thought that the homeless woman blocking the police vans was clear in disguise, Turns out not not to be just randomly a, a, an unhoused person blocking the, you know. I'm not sure which is more convenient writing. You know, it, yeah, it being a random, you know, just like random time, random place, random person, just like super convenient for, for Luke himself. Like, I, at least in the, when, when you know, when, when Wilson Fisk makes that epic escape at the end of Daredevil Season 1, that's because, the, you know, one of the guards in the car was in on it, and had, he had a bunch of people who were in on it, and just, you know, instead of just this random, yeah. Cage breaks out, exciting chase. Him ending up in a dead end, then breaking through a door, has to be a Matrix reference, right? Matrix 1 at that. And Luke sees a robbery about to be pulled off with a poster of Stan Lee, RIP, saying, if you see a crime, don't stand by. Something like that. I forget the exact words. And one of the robbers and Luke are both really happy to see Method Man. I love how, you know, the, the, the robber tries to have a conversation with Method Man, and Method Man is like, are you really having a conversation? You know, 
are you really going to start a conversation right now? You know, and Luke and Method Man happily swap hoodies, and the shopkeep later sells Luke's. You know, Method Man doesn't need the money, and you know he, yeah, he goes on a radio show and talks about yeah. For a while in the interrogation chamber, the only thing Shades will say is lawyer, two-line vocabulary, more like one-word vocabulary. I just walked away, ugly pants and hands in pockets. We had another musical break, but it's on the radio since the club isn't active right now. Very clever. Lots of people wearing bullet hold hoodies. Solidarity. Love to see it. Luke trapping Turk in the trash can was funny. And yeah, like, what did he say? Tomorrow they'll do trash pickup. Yeah, he'll be, he'll be, you know, like, he might be somewhat dehydrated by then. And he'll be really, really hungry, but that's it. That's the, yeah. And Luke finds a big bomb at the warehouse, carries Domingo out in time. Something I've never seen before. Even you can't stop him. Building hype for the finale. Now, let's see. Yeah, love that it goes from the camera showing Domingo to a photo of him that Knight is looking at. And Stryker catches up with the rest of them at Pops. I'm guessing the suit and powers are somewhat like what they are in the comics, but I have to admit I have not really read Luke Cage comics. And the What the Flick people point out that Method Man is a fan of Marvel, so he wanted, you know, and that's also, like, a bunch of songs that he appeared on were also in the, you know, and, and you know, played over the course of the season. They thought it was a bad cameo. I don't know. I thought it was fine. I understand their perspective, but it didn't really bother me, personally. And that brings us to the final episode of the season. Episode 13, You Know My Steez. The fight between the two half-brothers is great, possibly the best action of the season. Love the intercutting with their younger selves. But, yeah, again, like, it would be even better if it was Cornell instead of Stryker. I guess they couldn't have that kind of intercutting, but... Yeah, you could have, like, intercutting between their earlier, like... You know, when, when one of... Like, yeah, when Cornell throws a punch, it could be him saying something insulting to Luke... And, you know, when, when Luke ducks the blow or punches back or something, it could be, you know, like when he said, you're fired. And he says, you can't fire me. I quit before I came in. And, yeah, so, you know, basically the suit is the full body version of the gloves that gave him super strength that he used on the cop he killed. Actually, I guess, no, no, he wasn't wearing the full suit. He just, he powered up the the gloves and yeah you know and they they make sure to you know they make it clear that it let's see did it absorb bullets it didn't look like they bounced back off but certainly you know it's not you can't just yeah I, I feel like I saw someone shoot at him at the very start of this episode certainly there was something showing there was something that he could just walk away from that usually would be a problem. And yeah, like basically the finale wraps up every loose end. Like by the end of the, the season, Mariah is still, you know, but yeah, she's basically now fully taken over for Cornell. And yeah, you know, for a while, we think we're going to get the satisfaction of seeing Mariah pay for her crimes, but... She managed, you know, yeah, she had Candace killed, and yeah, they just, they don't really have anything definite on her. And Knight is understandably upset that Mariah walks. Very passionate goodbye kiss between Claire and Luke right after he agrees to go with the feds. And, you know, he's like, I was, I was about to get something hot and black. You know, we can, we can buy some coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts, mm, not the same. And the season ends with Luke in the car with the feds. But, you know, the uh, I have, I, I, yeah, the, the other guy who was helping to make sure that the, that Pop's barbershop was still 
um, what's the word? You know, lo still looked pristine and such. He found the file that proves that Luke was innocent. So, yeah, I mean, I already know that you know, Defenders is coming out before season two of. So yeah, I I don't know. I I, I kind of feel like they have that. It's it's a little bit like how the, when the first Thor movie ended, it's like, you know, how is Thor going to get back to Earth? And it's like, you know that Avengers comes out next year, right? You have to get him to Earth somehow. And it's this thing of, you know, ah, oh, he must have used all his dark magic. And, you know, just, yeah. I don't know, I, I guess, I mean... No, yeah, yeah, Claire said, I know a really good lawyer, but Luke said, I've done nothing wrong. So he didn't want... Yeah, I guess maybe that is how, because he didn't meet Matt yet. He met Jessica, and I don't know everything about how Iron Fist is going to fit into Defenders, but I've heard some things, which I guess I'm not going to talk about in this video in case they are spoilers. But, yeah, so the... Let's see, yeah, and, you know, the the picture of Biggie goes down and an art you know thing comes up but it still has crown you know and now it has two crowns two people and two crowns I think two shapes and two crowns and yeah so so the what the flick people said too much of the episode is just two people punching we the audience don't feel a strong enough sense of conflict between there's not enough history Diamondback continues to be the least interesting villain on the show So, I wrote the following before I had seen a single episode. You know, I, yeah, I, I wrote that I expect the season to tackle an issue that, while universal, is especially difficult for black people in America. Crafting your own identity, figuring out who you are, making it a positive one, trying to be a force for good, be successful solving problems, making things better, despite how much the deck is stacked against you because of prejudices, systemic racism, etc. And, yeah, I would say the, the show does a pretty good job of, you know, yeah, Luke, over the course of the season, I mean, at first, it's like, you know, he now has to kind of start over. He lost the bar that he loved so much, you know. Was it Jessica Jones said, I've never seen a bar this clean, you know. And, yeah, it's it's gone, McCready. And, you know, it's, he's not going to stay with Jessica because of how complicated that is. So he goes back to Harlem. And, yeah, I mean, he basically, he doesn't really want to get involved. They managed to get him involved you know, but, yeah, it is, yeah, and, let's see, yeah, so, you know, it is more, and it, it's, it's not quite an outright action show, like Daredevil Season 1 and 2, but it is more of an action show than Jessica Jones Season 1, and, yeah, so, worst to best, once again, love them all, Daredevil Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, and Jessica Jones Season 1. I It's going to be difficult for the other shows to top Jessica Jones Season 1. I, you know, intelligent explorations of trauma is just so important, in my opinion. And, yeah, I'm going to quote a few fellow critics. There's something wonderfully sub subversive about a show that's geared towards teenage boys that not only aces the Bechdel test, but portrays adult and complex ideas about female sexuality. And they gave it a 9 out of 10. And I have to agree. it's That's really, really great. And one critic said, I worry people will quote lines that use the N-word that in the show are acceptable, but obviously in real life are not. And... I, I do think that is an, an issue, but I don't think, I think black people want, oh, uh, that, actually, yeah, that's something I wanted to, obviously, in real life, it is up to the, the black people in an environment to define how they want to use the N-word, uh, you know, it is not, but it is not for, it is not for white people to use. And it is, yeah, you know, the, the, in the show, it often has meaning, you know, 
notice who uses the N word. Notice, you know, for example, Luke hates the word. You know, at one point, you know, a kid is holding a gun uh, oh, to him, a kid, you know, and he says, Young man, I've had a very long day, but not long enough to let someone call me that, you know. And let's see. Yeah, so various critics have said that there are too many villains, and that's, I hate to say it, but yeah, I don't really have a problem with Domingo's presence, but definitely something, they should have done something about Stryker. I get it, you know, it's, it's an MCU sort of thing, you know, I, I guess now it is possibly in the MCU Daredevil exists in the MCU now, but it's not 100% clear if it's the same Daredevil or if it's just played by the same actor. But yeah, so the... the yeah. The MCU likes having climactic fights between the protagonist and someone who has the same powers. You know, that's just... that's their thing. They, they, they like doing that. And so, yeah, that... I, I don't think it's a problem that there was a fight. I think it's a problem that we didn't get much of a, you know, yeah. I think if Stryker had been there from the start and they didn't, like, he's he's too, like, he's like a sociopath and almost psychotic. Like, he's, it's just, yeah. And, and yeah, Cornell was legitimately interesting. I don't hate that it's Mariah that kills him. And I get taking several episodes, um, you know, the, the, her not immediately becoming like him, that it takes several episodes for her to get there. I guess I feel like maybe that should have been season two, but then I, I, it's possible they have something better planned for season two. But, but yeah, I would have, I, I think it would have been great if the finale, if it was Cornell fighting Luke, and then, let's see, yeah, and he, like, he goes to the hospital, and Mariah comes to, to try to, you know, comfort him, and he's, like, really mean-spirited, he, he feels like he lost, he can't handle that, so he starts sniping at her, and then he claims that she wanted to be, you know, yeah, she claims that he, he, he victim blames her, and then she kills him. You could even still have it be violent, like, actually, yeah, well, let's see, if it's in a hospital, I guess it would be difficult to make it violent and still have... Maybe he doesn't go to the hospital, maybe the suit is disabled, and then he agrees to stop hitting Luke, but the cops don't have anything on him. It's... So, yeah, some, something like that, you know, so, yeah, and then you just have the scene the way it plays out in the show, as it is, you know. And, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and have it end on her agreeing with Shade, Shade, so that they can hide this, and, yeah. I don't mind the idea of Stryker being there at all. I think they, yeah, if, like, for a while he was working alongside Cornell, I mean, maybe it, maybe he could have been the one who shot uh, shot Pops in the barbershop, and then he manages to get away from Cornell, instead of Cornell killing him, and then you could have a little bit more conflict between him and Luke, and then he ends up... Yeah, I mean, the fact that he doesn't die, I guess that means he might return. Now, some people say that this is too similar to Jessica Jones Season 1 and Daredevil Season 2, Certain events happen at the same time of the season here as they do there. I didn't really notice that, but I guess it might be a problem for other people. And, yeah, various people said, you can clearly tell the difference between Luke Cage and Carl Lucas, and that's 100% true. Like, body language, the way he talks, the just the whole thing, he really did... He changed, you know, the powers changed him, and him being this, like, he never meant to be a fugitive. He he just 
you know, he was gonna serve, he was gonna do his time, even though it wasn't his crime, and yeah, you know, obviously he had to flee the flee Seagate after the the experiment. If Rackham found out he was still there, you know, he's gonna find some way. If he even if he can't find a way to kill Luke, he's gonna find a way to make Luke wish. Rackham just killed him. You know, Squabbles, uh, was he still? Ah, crap, I, I forget if anything happened to Squabbles there. But, you know, Reva. Rackham knows that Luke cares about Reva. Uh, you know, he has a million different things he could do to hurt her. And, yeah, some have said the season is not that much about Luke. He's not the most interesting character. I... I don't really disagree. I, I disagree that it's a problem. I I get it. You know, people want Luke Cage. They want Power Man. They want what they got in the comics or what they heard was in the comics. They want, you know, I can understand. Like, obviously, if you thought this was going to be nonstop, like him, like if you... If you watched Daredevil season one and you thought that Luke was gonna kick as much ass as Daredevil does, you know, like, yeah, obviously you're gonna be disappointed by this season. I completely get that. I just I don't think that would be as interesting. And I agree. Yeah, he's he's not the most interesting character, but the interesting characters of the show tend to get a lot of screen time and exploration. You know, Cornell, Mariah. Pops, yeah, you know the the, and yeah, some some have said it's it's great that his superpower literally is his skin. You know, him being black is not a detriment. It's not a weakness. It is his superpower. And yeah, various critics have said there are too many episodes. They have to stretch like with Daredevil and Jessica Jones, and that's true. I I hope that isn't true of all the Netflix shows, but yeah, so far it's been, you know, I've watched three different shows, four seasons total, and all of them have to stretch, and it's just, yeah, I, I mean, maybe that's why Defenders is only eight episodes. They, that was a way to avoid stretching, and let's see, season two of Iron Fist is only ten episodes, so... Yeah, but, you know, I continue to love these. I'm, I'm so happy that I started watching these, which, you know, if, if this is the first one you watch, uh, yeah, basically, like, Daredevil is returning, he, or he's becoming part of the MCU with Daredevil Born Again, and I was like, there's only three seasons of Daredevil. I can watch three seasons of Daredevil before, you know, and now it's on Disney+. Plus. I'm, you know, I've never had Netflix. I'm not sure I ever will. But Disney+, Plus, yeah, you know, why not? I, I have that because they put MCU-specific stuff only on Disney+, Plus. so, yeah. And then I read, do not watch season three of Daredevil without having watched Defenders. And then I was like, I mean, I'm not going to watch Defenders without having watched the other one, you know, and it's, yeah, it's only 13 episodes, the, the longest seasons of these shows are 13 seasons, and, yeah, counted it up, it was like, what was a hundred, a hundred some episodes, if I watch one per day, that's not a huge commitment, so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm really glad I'm watching these, it's, it's, yeah, so, there's, there's so much, I love how much, individual identity these three shows have like you could show me like a minute of one of these shows that didn't feature any major characters and you know showed completely out of context showed from an episode I hadn't watched or uh, yeah yeah you could show me an episode from one of the next seasons if they keep this up at least and I'd still I, I believe I would be able to have a pretty good guess which of the shows it's from. Like, there's such a strong identity to each of these shows. You know, Jessica Jones is so much about 
living with trauma and trying to figure out what, you know, am I still the person that was hurt? Am I, am I someone else? Is there anything left of the person? And should there be, you know, who do I want to be now that I have all this trauma? You know, Daredevil's so much about this Catholic, you know, yeah, dealing out a lot of pain as well as tolerating a lot of pain. And this idea of what is justice? Can you work within the law and um, do, you know, can, can justice be served without breaking the law? And then this with just black identity, Harlem you know the the way things are for black pe for yeah for black people today in new york in harlem and yeah i you know i'm so glad that it's not just like a couple of white dudes making all these shows you know it's very clear that some of the people doing jessica jones were young women i i'm not sure if all of the people working on behind the like showrunners, directors, and writers, I know at least some of them are black. I'm not sure. I'm not. I, I possibly all of them on on this show are black. But but yeah, you know, you can really tell this is not. Th these are not the stereotypes by people who've just watched some movies and such. No, these are lived experiences, and they actually, yeah, just love to see it. So, Iron Fist is next. I have heard so many people say that it's terrible. So, yeah, I'll I'll see. I've uh, you know, people have said that he he's like a whiny bratty character. So, yeah, I mean, I'll keep my eyes open. I I heard people criticize you know, like if if you listen to like some some people really hate you know some of these other shows as well so anyway yeah i believe i'll be watching the first episode tomorrow and two weeks from now is when i'll do season 1 thoughts on iron fist so yeah i i don't i'm going to go into it with an open mind i'm not going to expect to be disappointed what what is that saying if you if you expect being, if you go into something expecting to be, expecting it to let you down, you will not be disappointed, or something like that, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, that is it for this one, so, I will catch you next week.